Welcome to the Dental Implant Practices Podcast, where each episode will explore how to integrate dental implants into your practice and into bone with your host, Dr. Philip Gordon. Hey guys, thanks for being listeners of the show. Go to dentalimplantpractices.com and find all of our resources. Also find us on Facebook, Dental Implant Practices page on Facebook. And go to iTunes and leave me a review on iTunes so we can help spread the message. Thanks. Welcome back to another episode of the Dental Implant Practices podcast. I'm your host, Philip Gordon. And today, it's a huge honor for me to introduce the dental malpractice defense attorney, Jeff Tonner. Now, Jeff, thanks for being on the show today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, you are a dental malpractice defense attorney. I'm going to do a little introduction on here and let people kind of know some of your background. So if uh, if I butcher it or get it wrong, just jump in and let me know. But Jeff, you've been a, uh, since 1998, you've been limited your practice to helping dentists. You've written two books, Malpractice, What They Don't Teach You in Dental School, Ideal Charting for Dentists. You have lectured in Arizona and across the nation on risk management record keeping, and other dental topics. You have defended over 3,000 dentists before the dental board and hundreds of dental malpractice court actions. Jeff has drafted and regularly reviews dental legal contracts, including office leases, asset purchase agreement, and both employee and independent contractor agreements. Jeff is also involved with dental practice sales and transitions as a broker for Western Practice Sales. Jeff founded the Dental Advocate his ideal charting for general dentist system containing progress notes, templates, consent forms, updates, and alert bulletins, and other legal aids, an unprecedented and proactive approach for keeping dentists out of trouble. Jeff graduated from Indiana University in 1977 and DePaul University of Law School in 1981, where he was a member of the Law Review. Well, Jeff, thanks for being on the show. That seems like a long resume, and I know you've got some some fantastic experience, and I'm looking forward to uh, having you share some of that experience for um, my dentist podcast listeners. Great. Let's get started. I know you're the the legal expert here in malpractice law. You know, you, we have some things that we wanted to cover, but I thought maybe you could kind of just do a, a brief introduction into uh, some of the some of the more common things you see in dentistry as far as dental malpractice, and then we can move into uh, implants and, and extractions uh, specifically. So the statistics tell us that every dentist should expect three to five legal actions in a career. Now, a legal action can be one of three forms. Uh, the first thing is it can be a dental malpractice action. And according to national statistics, the top three areas for civil malpractice actions are extractions, number one. Number two would be endodontics, uh, would uh, I'm, let's, let's back up. The extractions would be paresthesia or dysesthesia, usually from third molar extractions. Number two would be endodontics, which are typically overfill, short fill, or broken file. And number three would be implants. The second type of uh, action is a dental board case. I don't have national statistics on that, but in, in Phoenix, where I practice in Arizona, the top areas are number one, crown and bridge. Number two, complications during and after treatment and number three, implants. Or the third thing would be a demand letter. That could come either from the patient, but typically it'll come from an attorney. Dear dentist, you messed up and uh, you know we're gonna sue you unless you, we can settle this and pay us X dollars. So those are the, the three different areas that happen. The one thing that I find that dentists across the nation do not know is this. If you turn a case over to your malpractice carrier, and if the carrier settles it on your behalf, by federal law, it must report the settlement amount and a short synopsis of the case to the National Practitioner Data Bank. I assume most of your listeners will know what the data bank is. It has limited access. The only people who can come into it are uh, hospitals, uh, third-party providers, and then other dental boards if you apply for credentialing in another state. The problem with the reporting to the data bank, you may say, well, the patients don't know, the general public doesn't know, what will it matter? Uh, the thing is that the third-party providers, at least annually, go on the data bank to, look at, look, to take a look at your name to see if there's anything there. And if they find something, they may send you a letter. So, for example, one of the buzzwords is probation. So you've been put on probation for, it's your fourth Crown and Bridge case or something like that, you're on probation. And so they find that, and that's a buzzword that means something to them. So they'll write a letter, dear doctor, we saw that you're on probation. You better explain yourself. Uh, if not, we're going to uh, possibly drop you as a provider. 
So reporting to the data bank can have negative effects for your future income with your third-party insurers. So, so let me let me interrupt your moment. Uh, insurance companies, you mean, will will look and 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 not be uh, partnering with you for um, payments and insurance providership if if uh, you have too many actions against you. Right. So Delta Dental, for example, that's a big provider. Every year they'll go and look on, look and see what's on there. And if there's something on there, or if there's if if it's just a single case but a very high number then uh, that, that can be an issue with them, and they may, they may drop you as a provider. So I've had it affect dentists uh, deeply in the pocketbook when uh, an insurer or two who provide a lot of their income uh, drops them because of certain, certain actions. Okay, and, and one more thing with that. You said three to five legal actions per career. Do you see that being higher either on the West Coast or East Coast or in the Midwest? Or do you see that number going up over time? Uh, it's not really going up, but what is going up is the amount of payout. So here's, here's a number that will slap you in the face. Uh, according to a very good insurance company, which is called DBIC, Dennis Benefits Insurance Company, uh, they, are, they, are, they share their statistics with me. And I'll ask this of you, Gordon. What do you think the average dental board case would settle for? Oh, Put wow. you on the spot. Yeah, no, I think uh, so average... I don't know, 175,000 maybe? 81,000. Okay, wow. So that's when you think about all the all the little tiny cases, Crown and Bridge and all that kind of sure. stuff. Uh, you know, 81,000 uh, that's a big number. That yeah. is a big number. And that's what's going up, not necessarily the numbers that's going up. I guess I was thinking maybe kind of larger cases, but yeah, I I, I guess most of them aren't, aren't the big cases. It's normally, you know, redo this Crown or Bridge or this implant. This this endo failed. Now they now they need an implant. So um, do do you see um, those those uh, higher risks in different parts of the area? I mean, uh, I'm in the Midwest. Is, is it lower there? Is is East Coast higher, or is uh, California, you know, more more likely to involve litigations, or or is that kind of you know across the board equal? Uh, it varies a little bit, but not much. Uh, it it the kind of generally in states where there are a low number of dental board cases filed, there's usually a higher number of civil malpractice actions filed. They seem to, when one goes up, the other one seems to go down. So California, for example, doesn't have a whole lot of dental board cases, but they're very litigious otherwise. Uh, Arizona doesn't have a whole lot of dental board cases, or civil malpractice cases, but a lot of dental board cases. So, But gen- generally, it's about the same across the, the statistics I see. It's pretty much pretty even across America. Well, we'll continue. I know you were talking about, um, you know, what, what, the, what the most, uh, you know, you talked about civil and dental board and demand letters. Um, is, is there anything and else? Let me, let, did, yep. Yes, let me let me throw one, a couple more things in there. Uh, number two, the dental, the National Practitioner Data Bank will also notify the dental board and the dental of a settlement, and the dental board has the option of opening a case as well. So, for example, I know a dentist who had three implant cases upheld by the board, and so he was worried that if there were a fourth settlement. Uh, that would be reported to the board, and the fourth time they may put a restriction on his license, um, which which is a buzzword for the insurance companies to pick up. And two other things that go along with that. Number one, if you, the dentist, settle a case yourself with your own funds, there's no reporting requirement to the data bank. There's a case specifically on that American Dental Association versus Shalala uh, 30 years ago. So if you want to settle it, there's no reporting, which is great because then the, then the third-party providers don't find out and the dental board doesn't find out. So that's always a, that's always a good thing to, you know, if you can possibly do that. The other thing to know is when the, uh, your policy with your insurance company says that they have to have your consent to settle. So, you know, you review the case and they say, well, you know, maybe we should at least take a, a shot at settlement on this. So here, will you sign this blanket waiver? And if you do that, the insurance company can settle it for any amount. What most dentists don't know is you can also sign a limited waiver. So you can say, I give my authority to settle this case up to um, $25,000 or something like that. Uh, Most dentists don't know that, and they sign just the blanket waiver. And to give you an example of kind of cases that have gone wrong, there was a local dentist. uh, I did not handle this case. He told me about it later. But he uh, gave, um, there was a, um, um, endo, endo my, uh, there was um, heart issues that developed endocarditis from a, an extraction without 
uh, without the antibiotics. And so the damages are big. The liability was small. And so he signed a blanket uh, consent form with the insurance company, assuming that, you know, we're cost of defense or something like that. It settled for 325000 And he was blown away when he saw that. So you got to be real careful with those things. Do you, do you want to go into how to, how to deal with, uh, with those, or, or is, that, is that a different conversation? Do you want to keep moving in a different direction? Or? Yeah, that's probably a little different topic. So just to, it's just to know that the two, the two takeaways are, from this are that if you settle with your own funds, there's no reporting, uh, and that you don't have to give a blanket settlement. You can give a limited settlement. And, and you would obviously, in that case, want something in writing that, this will be settled. They can't take it to a board, and uh, so there's there's some there's some legal things that you could help people with that. I'm sure. Yes, yes. So, uh, when you settle a case, there's there are re- good releases out there, uh, and what the release says is, you know, you won't tell any about uh, anybody about this. But one of the most important parts of that release says you won't go to social media, because that's a huge issue these days. You're not going to go bad mouth me on social media. You're not going to go tell your friends. You can't. Uh, go take me to the board next year. We've settled it, and and we're all good. Exactly. Re- re- and, reputation and management, sort of, sort of speak. Yes, exactly. So obviously, uh, you could help people with that if they get into trouble there. But I know um, what we wanted to talk about, and what you really specialize is uh, keeping people out of trouble. Like you said, kind of prophylactically. Why don't, why don't you go into a little bit of that? Yes, most of the insurance company risk management lectures that I go to basically say, once you fall into the well, here's how you swim. Uh, and I'd rather make it so you don't fall in the well in the first place. So my whole approach is prophylactic. So if you if you chart and do certain things, um, you know you're not going to end up there, and that that's a good place to be. So let me give you another kind of example on that. Uh, I'm going to give you two different stories, and and you can find the common element here. So the first thing that Dennis should know is when um, a patient goes to a plaintiff's lawyer to sue. Here's kind of the progression. So the lawyer listens to the story. He's uh, impressed, at least by so far. He'll prepare written releases to get all the documents from you and others. And then he'll gather that up. He doesn't know anything about dentistry, so he sends it out to a plaintiff's expert. And the expert then calls the patient back or the lawyer back and says, you know, that there is or is not a standard of care violation. The second thing I want to tell you about is a story, a Coumadin story. There was a patient who was on Coumadin. They wanted to place an implant. The dentist did a nice job working with the physician and getting a release to take him off Coumadin. Uh, He went off the blood thinner, implants placed, no complications. Eight days later, the patient strokes out. So the patient files a lawsuit against the physician saying, had you put me back on Coumadin, then I would not have had this stroke. And the defense lawyer for the physician then says, well, wait a minute, the dentist could have done the same thing. And therefore, they, they get a copy of the records from the dentist. There's nothing in there. And they bring the dentist into the action as well. So the common denominator between those two situ- cir- uh, circumstances is that the chart is basically everything. So in the first instance, when I talked about how whether or not a plaintiff floor would accept a case, if your chart is good and you've got the right stuff in it, then when the expert looks at it, he's going to say there's nothing here. On the Coumadin case, had the had the dentist put the right stuff in the chart. And just as a side thing, what I recommend is on your written post-op instructions that you add a tag on there that says, you know, if you were taking blood thinners or other medications, contact your physician ASAP to resume them. If that had been in the chart, then the dentist would not have been brought into it. So, you know, as much as we talk about things to do to keep you out of trouble, basically it's chart, chart, chart. Charting is probably the biggest thing on the front end. And um, when we're talking about charting, obviously most things are going electronic. Um, what do you see in electric charting? Is that helping or hurting most dentists? And um, what do you recommend there? And, and, and can you offer any advice for people? Well, I, electronic is the, is the wave of the future. And, I, you know, I probably see four or 500 dental charts a year. I'm going to say hmm, two-thirds or maybe 70% are electronic and the rest are handwritten. So electronic charts should be great. But the problem that I see is that the templates that were developed by the Dentrix of the world are not very good. And um, I know that because I'm in the trenches. So we went down and we'd get beat up on it because they wouldn't have certain things in it. For example, 
Um, the Arizona Dental Board takes the position that if you're a general dentist and you do a root canal, you must have a rubber dam. So either you have rubber dam in your records or they have to see the clamps in the working link files to know that it happened. They won't just take your word for it that you used a rubber dam. Uh, and as more and more people are using electronic sensors, they usually take the clamps off when they take their working link films. So if you don't have it in your written record, it's an issue. Dentrix for a long time did not have that in there. So when we had a, de- when we had a root canal, an endo case, you know, it was like an automatic, oh, we're going to lose this. So um, what I did is I actually created my own templates. Um, and, and I'd rather have them beefier than not. So, for example, sticking with endo, you know, purulence is only about 10% of the time. And, and in my templates, I have that in brackets. I'd rather have you t- nine out of 10 times highlight that, hit delete, take it out of there, as opposed to try to remember to put it in, in the 10% of the time that it happened. So if you have good, beefy templates, uh, that's the best way to go to protect yourself. Yeah, no, I agree. Now, would you say... How much of the cases or the malpractice uh, cases that you're seeing are, are a result of, of poor charts or, or bad charting technique? Well, again, if we want to go back to DBIC, uh, they say that 90% of malpractice cases have either poor or marginal charting. So that's poor or marginal. That's not even average. So they're saying in almost all the cases that they're saying the records are really bad and that it does handicap the dentist. Sure. So there's... Ninety percent of us have uh, room for improvement on this, for sure. If <laughs> if if not a hundred percent, I would I'd be willing to say. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Sometimes I'll you know I'll, a dentist will call me and ask me to defend them before the board or in a civil case, and and they'll say, "Oh, don't worry, my charts are really good." And I you know I I don't say anything. I bite my tongue. But when I see them, most of the time they're not. And you know the funny thing is, I mean, most of the for most dentists, charting was not taught in school. So the way the most of them learned was when they were an associate dentist for whomever, they picked up that person's charting, good, bad, or otherwise. And then they just kind of maintained. And, you know, every once in a while you hear a, you know, about a risk management course or something. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I should probably take that sometime. But uh, it's, it's charting, charting is, a, is a tough issue for dentists. You don't make any money doing it. You don't like to do it. Uh, oftentimes you hand it off to your uh, assistants to do it. And uh, it's it's really important, but it's it gets you know second position. Sure. Yeah, and I think uh, more and more these days, it seems like you know that's just one less thing you can drop uh, drop your guard on. So I I, I think I've heard something about this before. Let's let's move into about um, you know the the type of people or the type of cases or the type of you know issues that you're most likely to get in, into malpractice with. So let's let's start breaking those down. Obviously. Um, um, there's certain types of people or certain types of procedures or, or certain variables that are more prone to malpractice cases. So let, let's start diving into those. I, I generally tell patients two things. Number one, if your gut tells you that this is a, a problem patient, then terminate them. Dentists tell me that 5% of the patients cause 95% of the problems. And so I say to them, and you keep them because, and I get this blank look, the, the real answer is because they walked in my door someday. So once you do an initial exam, you have now created the dentist-patient relationship, and that stays forever unless either party decides to terminate them. So you certainly can do that. So, you know, so if I, and, and the rule of thumb I always use is when you're going down the schedule that morning and you get to the 3.30 and said, oh, my God, it's Jeff Tonner. Jeez, I hate that guy. You know, that's the one that you should terminate. So, you know, let them be someone else's problems. The second thing that I've done is I have actually kept statistics over the years, and I have the seven factors uh, of the person most likely to file a dental board action. So number one is female, and I'm even taking into account that most dentists tell me their practice is made up of 60% female, 40% male. So uh, most of the dental board cases that are filed are female. Number two is age 45 or above. And number three is employed in a health-related field. Nurses are the worst, the absolute worst. I can't explain one and two, but I think I can explain number three, and that is a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So in their nursing training, uh, they had 45 minutes one day on the oral cavity, and now all of a sudden they're experts, and they know better than you on what should be done. Uh, Factor number four is when the patient starts to use dental terminology. So normally they'll come in, they'll point to the lower right of their mouth and they'll say, I got a problem oh, right here, it hurts. Someone else may come in and say, I've got something on the buckle of number 28. 
and you say to yourself, how did they come up with that? Again, I think it's a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. They went on the internet for a while and they learned a couple terms to throw around and all of a sudden they think they're hot stuff uh, and they can, you know, they, they, they know it all. So that's another red flag to look out for. Numbers five and six are dental office shoppers or people who refuse to pay for x-rays. And for those two factors, read in the word cheap. So they want A plus dentistry at D minus prices. And then the last one is, is something that is so funny. The first time I saw it, I thought it would be a one time in a career issue, but it, it comes up repeatedly. And that is where a mother makes decisions for her adult son. And I'm not talking about college. I'm talking about something else. So you got a new patient exam, 30 year old male in the chair, you walk in, mom sitting in the corner. And when you start to ask questions about his dental health, mom's doing all the answering. Uh, so they've never quite cut the apron strings and, and that becomes an issue as well. So I have found that those factors will help identify the type of person who will file dental board complaints. So again, if your gut tells you this is bad or that profile helps you identify it's bad, then think about terminating a patient. Yeah, you know, as you describe that, I've, I've pictured some of my trouble patients in the past and my, my top ones definitely fit most of those categories, I must say. Yeah, when I've got a regular three-hour lecture on risk management, and when I do that, I always encourage the staff to come, and I always stop at that point before I tell them the profile, and I give them, oh, three or four minutes, and I say, if you knew three people today had filed dental board complaints against you, but you didn't know who they were, what would your guesses be? And so they huddle up and they write down that. And then I tell the profile and then I say, you know, what's the, you know, how many of you match that? And most of the hands go up. So I think that goes hand in hand with what you said first, you know, go with your gut instinct and know, is this a right fit? What are these people's expectations and, and can I meet them? And I think usually if you do some sort of screening or interviewing or new patient process, you know, get, get to the heart of that and then, and then go with your gut because um, unfortunately, you know, we're in this field to serve and help people, but but you just can't help everybody. Yeah, and Philip, something else too that most dentists don't understand is in the if let's say you're in the middle of your new patient exam and things just aren't going right, you can just stop right there and tell the patient. And probably the way to phrase it would be to say, you know, I'm sensing here that you and I are on the same page, and in order to have a good dentist patient relationship. You know, we need to have the same philosophy, and I think you, try to put it that way, I think you would be happier if you found another dentist. So don't charge them for the exam, don't charge them for the x-rays, let them go on their way, and uh, you've never accepted them, there's never been a meeting of the minds between the dentist and the patient, and, and the relationship's never established. And generally... They're mad about it for a day, then move on and seek out their next. Exactly. Seek on their next victim or target. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Now that we kind of know what that that patient or person looks like or acts like, and we kind of know some of these things, let's let's go into implant specific. Because what I noticed when you read off the civil, the dental board case, and the demand letters, you know, implants was on each of those lists. So let's let's kind of dive deeper and, and go into implants in specific and saying, okay, um, someone out there placing implants. Tell me kind of what is catching red flags these days. What's, what's catching attention and, and what are some things to keep in mind? One of the things that I find, maybe the, maybe the most common thing I find is if you don't have an ideal placement of the implant and you're going to restore it as well and you're thinking you can do it with an angled abutment. So you take your final films, you look at it and you say, ooh, I thought, I thought it was a little better than that. It's not, but it's not bad. I've restored hundreds of these before. I can do this. If that happens, you need to make sure you put that in your notes. Because what happens is the patient ends up going somewhere else. Another dentist looks at that and says that's non-restorable, and they foment them to file a dental board case. So if uh, just in general, if things don't go the way that you like it to be, not your fault, or, or sometimes your fault, but usually not, the, the key on charting is to make sure that you note in there that you know that. So uh, an overfill on endo, you know, it's uh, got to purchase inert. It's probably not going to matter, but you have to write down that you know that and that you told the patient. Same thing with the implants, okay? It's an angled uh, uh, placement, and you're thinking, eh, it's not bad. You know, note on there that it's a little bit angled, but that you can restore that with an angled abutment. It won't be a problem. So as long as you have that in there, that's, that's not going to be an issue. Uh, the second thing are patient expectations, 
Um, I think dentists, I, I think patients believe, and I'm not saying this is wrong, uh, but they believe that implants should last a lifetime. So if for some reason it doesn't last a lifetime, then they think that they should get their money back uh, as if it's a lifetime warranty. And of course, the problem is, you know, you have smoking and people who think, and once I have an implant, I don't have to ever come in for hygiene and things like that. So that can be an issue as well. Uh, another another item would be what do you have to have uh, for implants? And it's in the uh, Pano versus CBCT controversy. So there are states that say Pano is fine. Uh, we're, uh, some states will say, no, you have to have a CBCT. If your state doesn't say that, it's going to get there eventually because everybody's doing it now. Uh, I even see endodontists now using CBTs uh, a lot of the time. So uh, I believe it's it's going to get there. And if something happens and the and the implant uh, fails, then of course the expert witness for the plaintiff will say, well, you you know, if you had a cone beam, you would have known where to place it, and you didn't, and and therefore that's an issue. Um, I also see bone graft material fail, and it gets redone a lot. So, you know, so you, uh, let's say you do the extraction. So you extract it, you put the bone graft material in there, and it fails. And you do it a second time, and it fails. And now you place an implant with uh, bone graft material, and the bone graft material fails. And now the threads are exposed. And, you know, I guess the problem that I see with general dentists doing that is they hang on a long time onto these things, as opposed to getting out to a specialist if it, if it doesn't quite work the way you want within a fairly short period of time. So I see I see that a lot. So so um, so knowing when to kind of cut cord and move on, you think, huh? Exactly. I think that's I think that's very. Um, I, I would say that most of the most, if not all, of the bone graft materials, the dentist will tell me afterwards. You know, here's this point in time where, boy, I wish I thought about referring out, and I wish I had. But they're just, they're scared to do it because it hasn't worked. The patient's grumbling and they're thinking themselves, you know, Jesus specialist is going to throw me under the bus. Um, so, you know, I guess one thing, if, if nothing else, I would think your specialist would have your back um, because things sometimes don't go right and, and they know that and they hopefully can help you with those types of things. But I, I see people, I see dentists generally hang on to that too long. Uh, also, consent forms, I think, are important. Um, I had a little deal. My dad had a surgery, medical surgery, and there were two ways to do it. And he wanted me to look over the consent forms, and I did. And they were a really nice job on there saying, if you use method A, you have an X percent chance of success. And if you use method B, you have a Y percent chance of success. And I thought to myself, wow, that, you know, I've never seen a dental form with that in it. So, uh the, the dental forms, for example, the ones that I created out there, have percentage of success in there and define what success is. Uh, so, for example, if we want to go back to the endo, success would be defined as A, getting you out of pain, and B, keeping the tooth for a period of years, i.e. not forever. And then you can put in there, you know, uh, that my chances of success are 92% or some, whatever you want to, to put in there. And that way, if it fails, then either retreatment or an apico, you can say, I'm sorry, you're in a nice way. I'm sorry, you're just one of the unlucky 8%. So I think that's important, and I think it's important to have that in um, implant consent forms as well. Yeah, because that, that tells people, you know, th there is a chance for failure. It doesn't always happen, but it can happen, and, and here's, here's the numbers on it. And the funny thing is I find with patients with low dental IQ, if something goes wrong, they automatically assume, well, the only way that this went wrong is the dentist messed up. Uh, when, it, when it comes to medical, it's like, well, I guess it happened to me. I think part of that is because normally there's medical uh, that will cover all the expenses. And when it comes to dentist, dental, you have to come out of your pocket a lot of times. So that makes a big difference. But uh, I, 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 I don't think that um, dentists manage patient expectations uh, very well. When I came up with this idea, I started asking my friends who are all my age and all have crowns, hey, when you had that crown put in, what did the doctor tell you how long it would last? Uh, didn't say a word. Well, what's your expectation? Well, I got everything from, you know, a little to a lot. You know, uh, some of these people say a couple of years and others would say, well, you know, I've got this one in the, in the, you know, a number 31 and it's lasted, you know, 35 years. So, I, you know, generally dentists will say five years because that's what insurance companies will pay. 
And so if that's, if that's the way it is, then your consent form should probably have something in there. My expectation is this crown should last whatever you want to put in there, a period of years with proper hygiene every six months, uh, you know, uh, that type of thing. So I think it's important to try to manage the expectations so when something doesn't go wrong, they don't automatically believe it's the dentist. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So it's not always... It's not always the dentist's fault. It's a, you know, there's a, there's other other factors that contribute to that. Okay. What else are we looking at for uh, implant specific problems? Um, mini implants. Uh, the the thing I think with mini implants is uh, there should be something in the notes that the patient was offered, uh, you know, regular endosseous implants uh, and chose minis for whatever reason you believe is the appropriate thing on that. So. Uh, you know, typically when a mini implant fails, uh, those cases, the patient says, gee, I didn't know there were other kinds of implants. You know, he just told me he was going to put this in and I said, okay, fine. And there was no discussion about, uh, you know, the difference between the two of them. Uh, and again, that's where if you have good uh, templates, they should be able to explain the differences between those and why one was chosen over the other. Yeah, I've, I've seen some of those come in for... Uh for consults for myself and the patients always said, I, I didn't know that there were mini implants. I just thought they were regular implants. I didn't know there was a difference. I thought, man, there was, there was a, there was a breakdown of communication at that office because there, there are definitely two different things and the outcomes in my eyes are, uh, you know, night and day. So, yeah. So, so what do you see uh, about general dentist placing implants and uh, specialist placing implants? Obviously that's got to come up from time to time. It does. And uh, the thing is, you know, obviously a general dentist can do it and they can do a great job doing it but the patient needs to know that. So I think the consent form for particular areas, uh, implants, endo, extractions, at a minimum, uh, should say in there that uh, the patient realizes that uh, I am a general dentist and that this procedure can be done by a specialist. Some dentists would say, gee, I don't want to put that in there because then they'll go to the specialist. And my response would be from years and years of experience, they don't read those, <laughs> they don't read those consent forms, they just sign them. So if it's in there, you can say, you know, here it is. And, and w sometimes when you get in front of juries, uh, for example, when I try cases, win or lose, I always talk to the jurors afterwards. You know, what did you like about our case and their case and our expert and their case and me and the other lawyer, et cetera. That's how you learn. And they tell me pretty much to a person that if it's in the consent form, they're responsible for it. So the juries are pretty good about saying, you know, because there's always the, the patient always says, oh, they threw it in front of my nose and they gave me 15 seconds and I just kind of whipped, you know, signed it, you know, whatever. And the jury is saying, well, if you did that, you probably should have read it. So they're pretty good about that. So if you have that in the consent forms, I feel pretty comfortable defending you. That's, that's good to know, at least, because I, I think a lot of people, yeah, they don't always read through it or they don't highlight each specific part, but... Not to say that you can put it in fine print and hide it, but at least you're saying, hey, look, I'm, if I put together a good consent form and good notes, generally that, that gets you far. It's just having those two things done is, is the important part. Right, exactly. So you put in there, I'm a general. You realize I'm a general. A specialist can do it. Uh, they, I, I've, I've never heard of any, anybody who lost a patient because that was in a consent form. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of my patients uh, that I'm placing implants on know that uh, – Oral surgeons place implants too, and, and periodontists, and so that's 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 usually not the issue. It's normally where do they want to do it, or can they do it here too, or, or various other things. So moving away from maybe implants in specific, what what are the what are the biggest problems in malpractice industry? And say so you say, well, where am I going to really lose the most money, or you know, what are the big cases in dentistry? We we talked about some of the small ones. You said the average case is uh, you know maybe uh, eighty thousand now, and I thought I thought it'd be bigger, but you know, most of them are probably, you know, redo this crown or maybe, maybe redo that um, failed, Im, you know, extraction with, with a new implant or something. So, but, but what are the, what are the big issues in dentistry? So every year uh, in December, I canvass the insurance companies that I work for and I ask them, you know, where are your large settlements? And here are the, the four major areas. And number one is the most important. It's also the number one way a dentist can get into trouble. And that is the failure to detect oral cancer. So most general dentists will carry a million dollar policy. Um, you know, what's a full mouth recon these days? 50,000 plus. So if you mess up every tooth in the mouth, you know, they can be re it can be repaired with 50,000, 75,000, somewhere in that range. Uh, you know, so you can hardly go over a million dollars with the exception of failure to detect oral cancer. And uh, 
we don't have the time to do it right now, but I had a big failure to detect oral cancer case in 1992 where there was a little lesion, two two or three millimeter lesion in the beginning. A year and a half later, it was a 1.5 millimeter lesion on the, I'm sorry, 1.5 centimeter lesion on the right lateral border of the tongue. And their theory was this little lesion grew to this big one over a period of a year and a half and the general missed it and the hygienist missed it and the periodontist missed it. And uh, uh, they ended up doing a hemiglossectomy, so they cut out half his tongue. <clears throat> and that's when the lawsuit was filed as a personal injury case. And uh, as we were going along, he actually died during trial. It, uh, the cancer metastasized to his liver and lungs, and he died. And uh, so that's the, that's the nightmare case. Uh, we ultimately got that reversed uh, by luck, to be honest with you. But uh, then that's the number one way you can get in trouble is... So in, in that case, the damages were over a million dollars. Had we not gotten the case reversed, the dentist would have had to dip in their own pocket. So, you know, that's the one case if you're, you know, 55 years old and you're thinking retirement and you've uh, saved all your all your money and everything's good, you know, the uh, the lack of an oral cancer case can wipe you out. So what I recommend is that you perform an oral cancer screen every time you see the patient. Even if you see them on day one and you do a treatment plan for restorative and on day seven, you start the restorative, do it anyway. The more times, the merrier. Uh, you know, it only takes, what, 10 seconds to do an oral cancer screen uh, and make sure that you chart it. Make sure every time you see OCS negative. Uh, but that's the number one thing. And if the dentist remembered nothing else from this podcast, uh, the failure to detect oral cancer, just remember that and do it every single time. Where dentists normally get in trouble is the patient comes in every six months or a good patient. The hygienists are very good about doing and charting uh, oral cancer screens. And all of a sudden, for whatever reason, two years goes by and he doesn't see you. Now he comes in with a hot tooth. Uh, You're going to do a two-step endo. You're going to do a crown on it. You've got a couple of clusal adjustments. So now in a period of uh, six weeks, you've seen him four or five times and there's no oral cancer screen there. And now all of a sudden, later on, he gets oral cancer, and they, you know, work the time clock backwards. Squamous cell carcinoma duplicates every 60 days. Let's move it backwards in time. Oh, here, so this, this doctor came in when he did the root canal and the crown. Had he looked, he would have seen it uh, because it was big enough to be detected, and that's, that's how, how they get in problem in problems. So just do it every time, and you won't, you won't have to worry about it. Yeah, and, it, and like you said, that's, that's just a good thing to be in habit of, and takes takes five seconds and do it for if, if if only for selfish reasons do it to cya and you know just just a good good habit to be in uh the second area that i see they pay out a lot are over prescribing narcotics um there's a uh, i had another big case that i can i'll i can't uh, tell you about it now but the, a dentist <laughs> believe it or not gave uh three thousand five hundred percodan to a patient over a period of a year and a half and um you know, when I first got it, I thought, well, there has to be money or sex or something involved in it. There wasn't. It was just a nice old guy who couldn't say no, and she just used him. Um, so, you know, obviously that's that's a case that will never happen to anybody ever again. But while I had that, I was obviously doing a lot of research about the case. And I found out that when you get around 100, 150 narcotic tabs within a short period of time, short's hard to define, that's when you st- should start thinking about, uh, doing something else. So remember, you have to address the patient's pain complaint, but there's no requirement it be done with narcotics. There are dentists who uh, self-abuse and therefore lose their narcotic prescribing privileges, and they run a narcotics-free practice. So they'll give, uh, what, ibuprofen 800 or tramadol or something like that. So there's no rule that you have to use narcotics, but you do have to address the pain. So when you're getting to about 100 to 150 tabs, somewhere in that range, you might think about cutting down and uh, telling the patient, you know, I don't want to make you an addict, so here I'm going to give you some uh, a non-narcotic. Yeah, you know, you hear a lot about narcotics in uh, the news anymore, and and uh, I think I came across some study or uh, news post that said a lot of uh, people get started early because of get, getting their wisdom teeth out, and then they get exposed to you know codeine for the first time, and then it starts there. I mean, it's it's not people get be, become addicted um, because they go in for routine things. I mean, it's not like people you normally are looking to become an, ad, an addict, but they go in for a minor foot or a tooth surgery, get on the pain medicine, and never look back. So I think you know it's definitely more in the um, in the eyes of the public now, and so 
uh, and 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 historically, dentists have been easy to prey on because you you can fake a toothache. You don't you you can't necessarily fake a heart attack. You know, they hook you up to EKG or whatever. But you, you can always say, you know, this tooth hurts. I want some pain medicine. And so you know, you know, just being uh, aware of that. You know, don't don't just rely heavy on the uh, RX pad. Sometimes you got to shut patients down and be like, look, if we can't figure this out, we got to do something else. Uh, the third area where where large settlements are paid out were our third molar extractions for paresthesia. Uh, typically, they're young people, so they're going to have this the rest of their lives. Uh, and as a rule of thumb, the closer the apices of the teeth are to the IAN, the more likely the dentist is going to get second guessed. So, uh, you know, if, if you're within a millimeter or two of the nerve canal, you know, you might want to consider sending out to somebody else because the, you'll always get an expert witness who say that should have been in the hands of an oral surgeon at that point. And then the fourth area that I see is the failure to pre-med. Uh, pre-med has two issues to it. The first one is, should this person be on pre-med? That's almost never an issue because if you follow the American Heart Association guidelines, you're in good shape. Uh, or if the physician says pre-med, then go ahead and pre-med, even if, even if it's not on the AHA guidelines. The problem becomes in area B, which is um, compliance. So let's say here's a patient who needs to have, to have pre-med, and now you look in the records and there are uh, eight invasive procedures where pre-med should be listed. And of the charts that I see, 100% compliance is almost nil. So, you know, six of the eight will have written down that the pre-med was taken and the two won't. And Murphy's Law being what it is, one of those two will be the, the one that comes back just to bite you. being aware of it and doing it, but then also, like you said, not just doing it, but noting that it was done. Uh, sometimes I recommend a triple screening process for the office. So if the front office asks or the back office, whoever escorts the patient back to the operatory asks, and if the dentist asks, if all three of the people are tuned to this, then somebody will certainly, uh, you know, make sure the patient states they did take the pre-med and they'll write that in the records. Yeah, and, and you and you can get around that with um, you know various various flow charts or or checklists, right? You know, patient patient checklists when when they come in. Okay, do do you have allergies? Do you need to take a pre med? You know, have we taken? You know, so making making uh, front and back checklists might be a good way to, to to cover those sort of things. And then do and then doing it and then following up with the notes that you've done it. So why well, you know I think this is all all really good information and we've covered a lot of ground in in, a, in the a lot of time that I normally like to do for these podcasts. Um, unfortunately, learning about this is is just the first big step. I mean, it's kind of like okay, now I know a bunch of things that maybe I didn't know. You've you've half enlightened me and half terrified me now. Um, so <laughs> that's I, good. I guess that's a good thing. Thank you for that's that. A success um, for me. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. Now, um, so Jeff, what do I do now? I mean, obviously, um, I want to stay out of problems. I like my patients, but uh, more importantly, I want to keep practicing and, and stay out of uh, stay out of malpractice law. Um, how can you help? What what services do you have set up? And kind of talk me through about your website, the Dental Advocate, and your blog and your uh, your member section and, and what you offer practices. Cause I know I do an okay job, but I definitely need to beef up and, and myself in included, you know, what, what can you offer a uh, dentist like me? Well, thank you. Um, yes, my website is the dental advocate.com. And in there I have basically four components. So I have created my own templates that we talked about earlier and uh, there are software, there are instructions on how to put them into your software. It's a one-time only thing. So today, if you did a root canal, you'd pull up the Dentrix template, fill in the blanks. Uh, most likely, it's not going to have all the stuff in it. If you want to get my templates and you put them in the computer in the future, then you'll pull up my templates, which will be beefier, and, and hopefully you'll have a better chance of avoiding problems. Uh, number two, I created my own consent forms. Uh, and some of them uh, I've created because there weren't any around. For example, uh, immediate temporary dentures. I haven't seen a consent form on that, so I made my own. Uh, I made a consent form for reading uh, C CBC or uh, CBC t <laughs> for for reading. Um, I made my own consent form for cone beams because as soon as I saw one, I thought, "Oh my gosh." Uh, you know, you're only looking at the mouth and let's say there's a lesion up in the brain or something like that. And uh, it's like, oh, oh, someone's going to do that. So I create a consent form that says, do you want me to send, I'm only looking here, not, not the whole thing. Do you want me to send this out to an oral radiologist? They almost always check no, and then you're covered on that. And then the other thing on the consent forms, I put the percentages in there, which I didn't see before. 
Uh, the third component then are what I call updates and alerts, which are essentially uh, war stories. So a couple times a month, as I learn of something, I'll shoot a um, email out to subscribers saying, "Here's the situation. Uh, here's what. Here are the records that either you know helped him or killed her or whatever. Don't let this happen to you." So it's just a constant reminder uh, of what happens because the dental field changes very quickly. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of dentists who say, gee, I wish, I just wish somebody would tell me what to do. So I've done that. And then the fourth component is I have uh, videos. There's a three hour, for example, let risk management lecture of which this would be a small sub part. So, uh, if you're interested in buying the templates or the consent forms or subscribing, uh, go onto my website. Uh, I can do that. And the other thing I do is uh, I help dentists nationwide with their patient issues. So every day the phone rings and it'll be a dentist from somebody saying, hey, this situation just happened to me. What do I do? And, and I like that prophylactic approach because you're, you're at least cognizant enough to, wear, to realize that this could be an issue because something didn't go wrong or something went <laughs> very bad. So how are we, we going to chart this? What's the best way we can do? How are we going to be, pro, be proactive to help prevent that? So I, I'm happy to take any phone calls from dentists across the nation if they want to do that as well. Okay, so if I uh, if I get a hold of your packages and I've got my templates that I'm using and I'm doing my consent forms, um, checking your updates, I've done the training with the video for the staff, I'm probably going to be in pretty good shape. But then also, if, if something slips between the cracks, then I can give you a call and we can, we can talk about where to go from there too, huh? Exactly. Yeah. Now... Um, I know, you know, we were talking earlier, even if you're doing everything right, you know, just these things come up. So um, being prepared ahead of time is always better. You're probably going to find if you're doing these templates and consent forms, you're probably going to stay true to those principles better than you would. Those are almost like ways to keep you in between the ropes because on the templates, it says, you know, use the rubber dam. You've got to, you know, purchase, check all this and that, you know, it, it probably reminds the dentist and the uh you know, the assistant, hey, these are things I need to be doing, you know, and it, and, and it probably, um, you know, keeps you on track, you know, better than, better than if you didn't have them. So, so not only having it is, is going to cover what you're doing, it, it's probably just a better way to practice in general. You're going to have three to five legal actions in a career. If, uh, you know, if you pay some attention to this and don't just be an ostrich and stick your head in the sand, uh, you know, when it, when it's your turn in the barrel, why you're going to be in the best shape you could be. Yeah. And, and I think that's what anybody wants to say, look, you know, if, if these things are going to happen, at least, you know, it, it, at least I'd rather be prepared for them than not. And, and, uh, that's, that's all anybody wants to do is, is do their best work and know that, Hey, you know, I can, I can rest at the end of the day knowing I've done the right thing. And, and I think your, your services definitely allow people to do that. So, so Jeff, um, I'm going to go to the dentaladvocate.com. I'm going to check out your packages and get signed up. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, if I have any trouble with, uh, any of that information, um, you guys can help implement those into my office as well. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll encourage anyone listening to, to go to your website. And uh, do you also do lectures across the community? Are you going to be uh, out doing any big lectures this year when anybody can see you in person? I'm going to, uh, let's see, in July, I'm going to Vegas. And uh, boy, you caught me without my calendar in front of me. I don't quite remember. But here, here's something else, too. If you or your study club is interested in a lecture that you're probably not going to get anywhere else, uh, give me a call. I'm you know, happy to talk to you about you know, coming out to see your group and talking to them. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds great. So you can do uh, personal study club appearances and lectures, uh, you know, maybe for the, like Seattle study clubs or COIS clubs or things like that. I've oh. done COIS. I've done Seattle. <laughs> Excellent. So, Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, if I, uh, if I run past an hour, my bill goes up. So I think uh, I know how you lawyers work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to squeak out here before the hour is up. I, I appreciate your help uh, with, you know, teaching us all about how to comply with, um, you know, these legal matters better. And I hope uh, not to run into you too much except for on, on the friendly side of things. So looking forward that's to where, Yeah. I'm, I'm, that's, I'm, what every, that, that's what everybody says. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I got to tell you, I love working with dentists. I really do. I mean, they're really good clients. Uh, you know, they generally do what I say and they listen to what I, you know, what I have to say. And, and uh, they're just really good people. And, they're getting shoved, uh, sh you know, smacked in the face too much because of the dental legal climate. 
uh, you know, for a long time it was physicians only. Now, now they're going after dentists. So, it's I, I think it's prudent to to you know at least recognize it's going to happen to me someday, and and I should get prepared. Yeah, and and I think you're right. You know, it's just climates are changing, and you've got to you've got to change with the times and stay on board. And I'm glad you're leading the charge with that because uh, otherwise I wouldn't know where to start. So appreciate all the work you've done for all the dentists out there, and uh, look forward to getting going with your group here. Thank you, Philip. Appreciate it much. All right. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. You too. Bye.